Hey guys, Kenna here. So last class, we were talking about the growth of populations. In particular, we're looking at the growth of human populations. And we started talking a little bit about the difference in terms of affluence and poverty and how that could potentially impact the way that we use our planet and the way that we live on our planet, uh, both in positive and negative ways. And so hopefully you had an opportunity to go through that and think about the impact in terms of what that does for us and what that does for our planet. Today, we're going to take that a step further and thinking, hopefully, again, from the frame set of sustainability, I want to talk to you a little bit about globalization, McDonaldization, and the consumer culture. Now, you may have heard these terms before, you may not have, and either way, it's okay. Uh, but essentially, as we've expanded in terms of our numbers and in terms of our technology to the point where we can get things very quickly and easily that previously would be unavailable in our particular area, it's changed the way that our planet operates. And this globalization process has had a major impact on how we consume resources, the amount of waste that we produce, etc. So let's jump on on the essential questions. Number one, what is globalization and how does this impact the environment? Number two, what is McDonaldization and how does this impact the environment? Now, this does relate to McDonald's where you get the you know Big Mac and we'll talk about that when we get there. Number three, what is the consumer culture and how does this impact the environment? So notice these processes of economic development that we're talking about today. We keep trying to tie them back to how that impacts the environment. And number four, how can you avoid becoming McDonaldized? Can you avoid becoming McDonaldized? So I think the first thing we should do before we even kind of start having these conversations is really go ahead and jump in and define globalization, as this is really the process that's going to allow these other two pieces to come into play. So globalization is a process of interaction and integration among the people, companies, and governments of different nations. Now, this is largely driven by international trade. And as investments become more diverse around the world, and this is aided by the development of technology, we think about like TikTok being owned in China. Uh, this is definitely something that's becoming more and more common. And you may have heard some news program that talks about outsourcing and shipping jobs. And these are all factors and pieces of the globalization process. Now, this process has effects on the environment as well, but it also has impact on culture, on political systems, economic development and prosperity, and on human physical well-being in societies around the world. Now, a lot of people think of this as a very new thing with the advent of the internet, but globalization is not new. Okay? For thousands of years, people and later corporations have been buying from and selling to each other in lands at great distances, such as through the famed Silk Road, if you think about Marco Polo during the Middle Ages. Okay? Likewise, for centuries, people and corporations have invested in enterprises in other countries. I mean, the discovery of America is a great example of that. Right? Now, I use the term discovery loosely, you know, Columbus didn't discover America, but really he introduced it to the European, Western European nations, and that had a huge impact both economically and environmentally on the Americas in general, uh, but also on Europe and Africa as well. So likewise, for centuries, people and corporations have been really kind of investing themselves in other lands primarily for available resources, whether that was for silks along the Silk Road, whether it was for the slave trade going to Western Africa, whether that was for produce. When we start looking at South America, we think about the potato being exchanged coming back to Europe. All of these are great examples of the types of exchanges that occurred because of investment in these expansions around the world. And in fact, many of the features of the current wave of globalization that we're seeing because of the internet um, are similar to those that happened before the outbreak of the First World War in 1914. 
Now, I want to show you a map. This is uh, the Silk Road. And so you can see that while the main Silk Road was one particular path, there are other branches coming off this, the Eurasian step route, the main connecting routes. I mean, so you ended up with a whole network of trade routes that went across Southeastern Asia into the Middle East. You got to stop at Alexandria, Egypt. That was a powerhouse at the time. You got to go to Rome. This is another powerhouse at the time. And Byzantium at the time, which is now more known as Constantinople or Istanbul, if you prefer. Um, so there's a lot of connections between the eastern side of uh, Asia and the western side of Asia, little dips into Africa and Europe as well. Okay. But over the past few decades, policy and technological developments have really spurred increases in cross-border trade. We now have to talk about things like NAFTA um, and free trade and looking at the world tra uh, trade organizations. Cross-border trade, investment, and migration is so prevalent now that many observers believe the world has become a new type of economic entity, one that is completely interconnected between many different countries and that individual countries don't really have their own economy anymore. Since 1950, for example, the volume of world trade has increased by over 20 times. And just from 1997 to 1999, flows of foreign investment nearly doubled from $468 billion to $827 billion of foreign investment. Distinguishing this current wave of globalization from early ones, author Thomas Friedman has said that today globalization is, and I quote, farther, faster, cheaper, and deeper. So what does that really mean? Well, more countries are involved. It happens more quickly. They can get in at a lower price. And now there are more deeply tied connections between these countries that do trade. So this current wave of globalization has been largely driven by policies that have opened economies domestically and internationally. Governments have negotiated dramatic reductions in the barriers to commerce and have established international agreements to promote trade in goods, services, and investments. This takes advantage of new opportunities in foreign markets. Corporations like McDonald's, like Starbucks, like uh, you know, PlayStation, if you will, it's amazing how these corporations have built foreign factories and established production and marketing arrangements with foreign partners. Okay. When we start thinking about even American-made cars, for example, a big thing we've always talked about being made in America, right? They may still be assembled in America, but many of the parts are often actually manufactured elsewhere. They've been shipped off to get the raw materials and production values down so that they can sell you a cheaper product, okay? That means an entry price that's lower than what you would have seen otherwise. This is a defining feature of globalization, is this international, industrial, and financial business structure. And it really has developed in the years since the Second World War, and especially during the past two decades, as many governments have adopted more of a free market economic system. Now, maybe you've heard of laissez-faire. I'm not saying it's gone that far, but there's definitely more of a tendency towards this. And this vastly increases their own productive potential by creating a whole bunch, the word myriad means a whole bunch of new opportunities for international trade and investment. So countries that have raw materials can sell them to wealthier countries that need those raw materials to go ahead and manufacture goods and services. So technology has been another huge driver of globalization. Advances in information technology in particular, I talk about the internet, right, have dramatically transformed economic life. In fact, a lot of investment, what used to have been done with an iBanker, can now be done through apps. Okay? These companies that allow you to get a mortgage without ever seeing a person, right, rocket mortgage or something like that. Information technologies have given all sorts of individual economic actors, consumers, investors, businesses, valuable new tools for identifying and pursuing economic opportunities. 
And this includes faster and more informed analysis of economic trends. Buy, sell, stock market is not the same now as it was 25, 30 years ago. It's easy to transfer assets through digital banking. It's easier to work with a company that's in another country. I mean, the fact that we're having this class or you're watching this video because of Zoom or video recording is a great example of that. We're able to share information, transfer information at incredible speeds at the click of a button or the touch of a finger. That has never before been seen on our planet. And there are both upsides to this and downsides to this. So let's take a minute and go ahead and take a look at some of those. On the pro side, the economic development of poorer countries has been a lot easier, okay? Because they can seek these out external uh, investments, they can take care, uh, take care of their own investment in you know, processes and products and start finding places to sell if even if they couldn't sell locally. This has created kind of a global culture. Okay? And with the development of a more global culture, culture often comes a little bit more tolerance. I'm not saying it completely switches everything, but I think that there is more openness because there's more exposure to people of different races, religions, um, sexual preferences, so on and so forth. It encourages free trade. Okay? Because people want to make the best deal for themselves, they're willing to work with countries and entities that previously they may not have engaged with. And we could, not saying we always do, but we could begin pooling resources to make a big impact on global scale problems. And this is what I guess I hope for when I think about the environmental problems that are going to face us in the coming future. But there are downsides to this as well. Uh, the first one that pops into my mind is death of small business in favor of these major multinational corporations. And this gives us as the consumer sometimes less free choice about what we want or what we're interested in because the companies tell us what we're interested in. You know, the old mom and pop establishment, it doesn't do as well in this hugely globalized economy. And so if you have a mom and pop restaurant or business that you have locally and you can support them, I would, I really, really would encourage you to do so because it's a battle. You know, they talk about, uh, what is it, Black Friday is the big shopping day. Um, small business Saturday to me is, is just as important. Uh, along with the creation of a global culture, you also get homogenization. And so all of these cool things that make the unique features of different cultures around the world uh, become kind of watered down. And, and you don't have as much diversity in terms of the uniqueness of the different cultures as much. And the biggest countries and the richest companies, biggest governments, the richest governments have more influence over what happens in the world. Um, you hope for a benevolent government, benevolent corporations, but if there's anything we've seen historically, it's that uh, the more power, the more money, companies and countries have uh, tends to lead a little bit to abuse sometimes. Richer regions will always consume more of their resources. In the United States, we consume three times more than most countries around the world. Why? Because we as a country have more money. Now, is that a good thing for the planet? Well, as we've seen, there is a fixed limited amount of resources on our planet and the population is growing um, at a somewhat alarming rate. And as we've seen with COVID, globalized economies mean more world travel, which means diseases travel faster in a world that is globalized. We start thinking about bird flu, swine flu, now COVID-19, um, diseases that would have been relegated to local infections 
prior to globalization now can be spread amazing distances. And with that spread, they start infecting new individuals with different genetics and different immune systems, causing mutations, causing changes in the virus or the bacteria that is causing the infection. And you now have a very different beast than if it had stayed where it originated. So really, when we start thinking about globalization, we start thinking about the rise in power of the multinational corporation. Uh, you may have heard of the MNC. Okay. Recent dramatic increases in the transnational flow of capital across national lines, uh, people, goods, information, culture have really transformed the world. And these aren't little things to be overlooked. This is far reaching economic, political, demographic, and cultural changes. And this has elicited an increased political and civic concern over the impact of globalization on local culture and local peoples. And it has led to an increasing number of protests. The increase in multinational corporations and economies of scale has in the name of efficiency created a consumer culture that seeks lower costs by outsourcing materials and jobs. So in order to get the goods that you want at a cheaper price, right? When you're consuming clothes, when you're consuming uh, sunglasses, when you're consuming video games, when you're consuming food, all of that lower price comes at a cost because it means a lot of the jobs and materials that make those products are sent overseas to a place where they could be made or produced cheaper. And this has led to some notable protests, like the battle in Seattle. In 1999, protests in Seattle surrounded the World Trade Organization meeting and were to be launched of a new millennial round of trade negotiations, getting ready for the year 2000. The negotiations were quickly overshadowed by the massive, and when I say massive, there were no fewer than 40,000 protesters. And controversial street protests dwarfed any previous demonstration the United States has ever seen against an organization associated with economic globalization. Okay, so, when we start looking at the World Trade Organization, when we start looking at the International Monetary Fund or IMF or the World Bank, these large globalized financial institutions are now seen as threatening because of what they could do to jobs and security and materials. Yet a similar protest on May 28th, 2013, as students in Istanbul, Turkey staged a sit-in protest against an urban development project to build a mall in the city's largest green space, the Gezi Park. 100 activists were met with police opposition on May 30th, when water cannons and tear gas were used to disperse the crowds who had gathered in front of the green space. Finally, the tents and belongings of the protesters were burned and the park was barricaded. Using the internet, the activists reached out for help and organized a massive effort to retake control of the park. The protests soon poured into the streets as others, emboldened by police actions, joined the students in the park and Taksim Square. As the crowds grew, the protests soon began focusing on issues beyond just the development in the park and became a protest against the government of Prime Minister Tayyip I'm going to forget his name, uh, Erdogan, Erdogan uh, who many still feel stifled democracy and the opposition in the country. While the movement was largely um, an anti-government protest, call for reforms and resignations of the prime minister, its initial goal was a desire to preserve a green space in a city. And subsequent evolution highlights the way in which environmental movement and democracy are intertwined now. Further, the protests made use of social media and technology to organize a large group of people in a short amount of time. We've seen something very similar with the growth of the Black Lives Matter movement today. Okay. 
This use of technology has become unprecedented in the recent years of smartphones, and the internet has helped protests to grow quickly. Very similar when we saw the battle in Seattle on the previous slide. The main organizers typically are young college-age students, showing that the environment is a central concern to today's youth. And it brings up a lot of questions. Should environmental protection stop economic development? Especially when the world economy is still recovering from recessions as we start looking at you know, COVID-19. How does new technology influence the environmental movement at large? We think about the environment as being very disconnected from technology or even anti-technology, but we're using technology to empower those that want to protect the environment. Faced with a mobilized generation, the generation above you, your generation, do you think politicians are going to be more willing to listen to our concerns about the environment? How will new concerns about limited space, we talked about the growing population last class, and increased urbanization influence how we manage the environment? Remember, we have a finite number of resources and space is one of them. And people need a place to live. And if the population is going to keep growing, where are we going to put them? Some things to kind of think about as we go ahead and start moving forward. Now, I'm coming back again to the rise of the national multinational corporation because this is a big thing that people love their national multinational corporations, whether they realize it or not. Um, when you buy a brand name, when you look at buying Nike, when you start looking at buying something because it has a specific name or symbol or emblem on it, you are supporting the rise of the multinational corporation. The history of the multinational corporation is linked with the history of colonialism. This actually stems back to the expansion of European power across the world. We start thinking about British imperialism. Many of the first multinational companies were actually commissioned because of European monarchs that wanted them to conduct these expeditions to get them more wealth, more resources. Think about things like the Hudson Bay Company. Right? Many of the colonies not held by Spain or Portugal were under the administration of some of these earliest multinational corporations. One of the very first of these came up in 1660. This was the East India Company, founded by the British. It was headquartered in London and took part in international trade and exploration with trading posts in India. Another example, the one I mentioned before, includes Hudson Bay Company, which was incorporated in the 17th century. So a lot of these things that we think of as being very modern problems have their roots in very old processes. And we have to think about where they originated, what their intent is, and do the benefits outweigh the consequences. Now, one multinational company I'm going to highlight here. Um, I, I don't want you to think I'm vilifying them any more than any of the other multinational corporations. But because they got to be so good at what they did, we now talk about the process of their globalization using their name. And that is McDonald's. And so we have this concept of McDonaldization, what we know as the irrationality of rationality. How far can you go in terms of efficiency, calculability, predictability, and control before it becomes no longer what you originally wanted in terms of the flexibility of choice. So let's define it really quickly. So McDonaldization is the process by which the principles of a highly successful and revolutionary fast food restaurant are coming to dominate more and more sectors of American society, an increasing number of other societies throughout the world. The principles of McDonaldization are efficiency, by itself, we think that is a very good thing. Calculability, the ability to put a price on things. Again, we typically look at that as a very good thing. Predictability, we like to know what we're getting ahead of time. 
and control, being able to know what the outcomes are going to be. Individually, all four of these things seem to be very desirable. But one of the main means by which we have done this is through the substitution of non-human for human technology, replacing people with machines and computers. And again, McDonald's didn't create this. This goes all the way back to industrialization and Henry Ford. This is not something new, but we have to think about how good McDonald's is. There is McDonald's almost everywhere in the world. Almost every city of any size has a McDonald's and not just in the United States. And when you walk in, you know it's McDonald's. It's got the golden arches with the red and yellow, the McDonald's character in most of them. Okay. You know that you can get a Big Mac, right? You know that you're going to get the same golden French fries. So let's do a really quick brief history of McDonald's. In the late 20th century, McDonald's moved beyond the hamburger business by acquiring Chipotle, Mexican Grill, uh, Donato's Pizza, and Boston Market in the United States. And in the UK, McDonald's purchased Aroma Cafe and an interest in Pret a Manger, a sandwich restaurant chair. Okay. However, by late 2008, McDonald's no longer owned or had a stake in any of those companies, instead trying to concentrate on its own brand. So it actually sold off many of its holdings. Why? What happened? Well, the first McDonald's was actually created in 1948 by the brothers Maurice and Richard McDonald. Maurice Mac McDonald. That was his nickname. Okay. And they opened the first McDonald's in San Bernardino, California. And you'll notice there's just a single arch. Okay. One, one big arch. And it was purchased by a gentleman by the name of Ray Kroc. And there's an interesting movie out there that actually looks at the life of Ray Kroc. Um, and the corporation that we know of as McDonald's today was actually established in 1955. And that creation of the corporation is what allowed for the franchising that start, started the spread of McDonald's all over the place. McDonald's didn't go public until 1965. And it was traded as a public company between 1965 and 1968. And this boosted a whole bunch of steady growth by providing uh, income so that they could go ahead and create thousands and thousands. And at that time, they doubled the arch and created Ronald McDonald to have a very family-friendly face for the corporation. It wasn't actually until the 1990s that McDonald's started leaving the United States and going to other countries. But there are about 35,000 McDonald's in the 90s, and it had spread to over 100 countries. And that process happened so fast, right, that it was said that a new McDonald's was opened somewhere in the world every five hours. And it's interesting because McDonald's seems to have this kind of two sides to it. It has the side we talked about before that was going ahead and buying up and buying up and expanding and making as much money and getting bigger as possible. But in 1974, it also joined Philadelphia Eagles football player Fred Hill, whose daughter had been diagnosed with leukemia to found the Ronald McDonald House in Philadelphia. And this was just one of the many things that McDonald's would start doing in terms of charitable work. The residence McDonald House allows families to live near the hospitals where their children are receiving treatment. And by the early 21st century, more than 360 such Ronald McDonald houses existed around the world. And they now have the Ronald McDonald House Charities established in 1987, which helped to support those houses so that they can eliminate most of the costs for the families that stay there. So McDonald's is an interesting company. And, and when we start trying to kind of vilify the multinational corporation, we have to realize that all of these things have two sides to them. There's positive pros and cons. Now, McDonaldization, McDonald's obviously is the example and the namesake of the theory, but 
their model has been copied so many times. You think about Burger King, Taco Bell, Wendy's, Pizza Hut, KFC, similar restaurants. They all do essentially the same thing. They just weren't really the first one and they may not have been quite as successful at it. But when you go to any McDonald's in the US or even around the world, you know you're always gonna find the basic same food, basic same amount at the basic same value. And that's why people love McDonald's. It's predictable. You know what you're gonna get, you know basically what it's gonna taste like, and why would that be a problem? Well, as we all know, fast food is not necessarily that healthy. <laughs> And most of the items on a fast food menu are really high in fat and salt and pretty low in nutritional value. With obesity, heart disease, diabetes, and other health problems on the rise, especially in younger children, it's certainly irrational for us to be eating so much fast food. It's quick, it's easy, it tastes good, but it's not good for us. But in addition to all these adverse health effects, the production of fast food is also unhealthy for the environment because it results in tons of waste. It consumes huge amounts of fuel and emits a whole bunch of greenhouse gases. And hopefully you'll kind of keep this in mind when we come back and talk about this again, when we get into our food unit next. So associated with McDonaldization are these seemingly inevitable paradoxes of irrationality that seem to arise from rationality. Of course you want your company to be consistent and efficient and produce a good product consistently. Um, but the main reason we think of McDonaldization as irrational and ultimately unreasonable is that it tends to become a dehumanizing system that may become anti-human or even destructive to human beings. Okay. Can you think of any other examples? Okay. What other examples might exist of these irrationalities of rationality? Okay. Let's go ahead and finish up by kind of talking, taking a look at our consumer culture that we live in and how we can potentially avoid becoming individually McDonaldized. First, we have to define the consumer culture. The consumer culture is a culture where social status, values, and activities are really centered on the consumption of goods and services. And I start thinking about all of the uh, branding that goes on around things like TikTok and YouTube and Instagram and stuff like that. Uh, and it is very heavily driven by goods and services, right? You want this bag. It's a Gucci bag. It's the best bag ever, right? Uh, well, why is it the best bag be ever? Well, just because it has the name Gucci on it, not because it's built any better than anything else that you would buy anywhere else. Um, we put a huge price tag on the name, which doesn't always represent quality or value. In a consumer culture, a large part of what you do, what you value, and how you are defined revolves around your consumption of material goods. So if we want to avoid becoming McDonaldized, what kind of things that we can, can we do? Well, I think the first one and most obvious one is to consume less. I know that's not easy and I'm just as guilty as anybody else of consuming goods, but what are you consuming? How was it made? Okay. Where was it made? How far did it have to travel to get to you? A lot of these things can help you make better consumer choices. You can do things like do slow food, right? Instead of fast food, do slow food. A lot of slow food restaurants actually get local produce, okay? local meat. And by not having to ship it so far and not having it come frozen, we're producing less waste. We're having fewer miles traveled, which leads to fewer greenhouse gases. And so it's better for the environment. When you go grocery stopping, instead of going to a grocery store to go ahead and buy something shipped in from Ecuador or something shipped in from some other country, go to a local farmer's market. Costs maybe a little bit more, but the cost to the environment is far less because it hasn't had to travel all that distance. Okay, Audit a class. 
you know, learn more. The more you know, right? You remember those commercials? The more you know. Uh, as you go ahead and learn more, you make better decisions about a lot of different things. Instead of driving your car, which produces tons of uh, waste materials into the atmosphere, walk or ride your bike. Or if you do ride, if you do take a car, an automobile, try and carpool or take the bus. Okay. And it's weird to think about it in this day and age, but the environment is impacted by all the time you spend on a digital device that takes electricity. Um, try to unplug for a while. Try not to communicate electronically for a day. Limit how much time you spend on all your social media apps. Now, these suggestions may appear strange or unproductive or unreliable, even unreasonable at times. But if you try them, you may be surprised at just how rational such seemingly irrational behavior can be. I liked this quote, so I thought I would go ahead and leave it for you. The inexorable integration of markets, nation states, and technologies to a degree never witnessed before in a way that is enabling individuals, corporations, and nation states to reach around the world farther, faster, deeper, and cheaper than ever before. The spread of free market capitalism to virtually every country in the world. That's from Thomas Friedman uh, from an essay of the Lexus and the Olive. Okay. So what I would like you to go ahead and do is I would like you to go ahead and finish by going out and watching the video on globalization. Who cares? You do. Okay. This is again from We the Economy, the same ones that did the video on a bee's invoice. And think about what impact your consumer choices have on the people around you, the community that you live in, the country that you live in, and the planet as a whole. Both the people that live on it and the environment that all of that exists within. All right, guys, stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.